Reminding you, coffee's for closers. And if it's a flavored coffee, you can take the C off the front of closers. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. The choice to get on. Mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you, right, Gina Graham? That's right. Handball, Brian. You're running it too hot. David uh, Mamet's going to come in for one-on-one in the second hour. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, of course, American <laughs> Buffalo, every film ever. Theater Gina is freaking the fuck out right now. I loved uh, The Edge with Baldwin. Oh, yeah. All those all those years ago. I think he d- wrote, directed, he directed a lot of stuff, too. Anyway. Famous daughter. We'll, Spanish uh, prisoner. We'll get to uh, that. Uh, an auspicious weekend of racing for the Ace Man. Tell us everything. Got off to a little bit of a bumpy start because as I was finishing my fifth podcast on a Wednesday last week, trying to get out of here, try to get the wheels up about uh, about 4.35 p.m., I noticed at the end of uh, my, uh, not the last 20 minutes of my Reasonable Doubt podcast, my voice started to go out and it was just leaving. And uh, so what ended up happening is uh, by the time I got into the car and we were heading for Laguna Seca, I'd, I'd pretty much lost my voice. Now, that's good to a lot of people around me. I will concede that. But uh, the problem is, is when it's gone, it's gone. And I found myself, when, there's no louder place than the racetrack because they're oh. like firing up cars around you the whole time. And the head mechanic is like leaning in. And he's going, uh, you put the earbuds in, and then we got the ear cups, and then the volume on the radio's over here. And then I'm like, what channels are on? And he's like, he's like, what? What? He, he doesn't understand my voice is gone, and I have to l- pretty much mount him to get him to hear anything I'm saying, and I can't hear anything I'm saying, and I'm supposed to talk into the radio and stuff too, and I, nobody can understand me. So the thing that was hanging out, the cloud over our head was was literally a cloud over our head, which is it's going to rain. It's going to rain some over the weekend. Nobody's quite sure. It's going to rain some Thursday. It's going to rain some Friday. And then it's going to be nice on Saturday for the Trans Am race. This sounds like me trying to plan my period in advance. Yes, Yes. Very and difficult. I had some spotting. Yeah. I wasn't sure Uh-oh. if it was going to be a heavy flow day. So yeah. it was, uh, I was due to get into the car for the first time on Thursday. And my run group was going off at 2.15. Now, there was always clouds. There was some sprinkles in the morning, maybe showers in the late afternoon. But the whole idea was, can we get out there? on that, on a dry track, because, um, there are two types of tires in racing. They have slicks. That's when it's nice and dry and they have, um, rain tires. They call wets. They have the grooves in them. Now people always say, how come, uh, there's not more traction of the ones with the grooves in them. That's just less contact uh-huh. that you have. <laughs> if the slick is big and it's big, it's, you know, 14, 16 inches wide and you have a groove cut into it every three quarters of an inch, well, if pure slick, you'll get 16 inches worth of rubber on the ground. You back out the three sixteenths, eighth of an inch worth of groove times 10, 20 grooves. Now you're down to a 12 and a half inches of actual planted rubber on the ground. So nobody, but you can watch movies like Rush. I think there's a point where it's like, is, Jody Schechter coming in. He's coming in. He's getting on. He's staying out on slicks. He's staying out. There's a lot of strategy. Okay. Staying out, coming in. You're definitely faster on the slicks, but if it starts raining, then you're totally yeah. fucked. And sometimes it's a little wet on one part of the track, but not on another part of the track. And hedge th- your bets. You're trying to hedge. Like, is he coming in and getting on to wets? Because if you're on wets and it's raining and everyone else is on slicks, you're going to drive right past everyone. But if it's not raining, you're on wets. They're driving past you. So there's a lot of, what do we do? Now, we don't come in and do a tire change. We just either go out on wets or go out on slicks. But it was dry the whole day, so we went out on slicks. Now, the car is a beast. 
and it's got 900 horsepower, and it will light up the rear slicks regardless of whether it's wet or not. If you're in first or second gear and you stomp on it, it's a Camaro. We're looking at your car? Um, yeah. You, I assume? Tube, yes. We're looking at me driving a tube-frame Ferrari. Uh, sorry, tube-frame Camaro. little different. Now, um, so it's like, all right. So you get in the car. You get in the car about a half hour before you pull out onto the hot pit, the grid, whatever, whatever we're calling it. And you just get buckled in in your six-way harness, and you get your radio hooked up, and you get your air hose hooked up, and you get your net put up, and you're just there. Now now you're just there. One thing that I forgot about the first time I got in the car, which is a weird one, which is um, at a certain point, it's like, all right, we're getting in the car. We're going to pull out. Um, so I get in the car, and I always do things in, in order. I, I do the helmet. And the Hans device, which is that yoke thing that goes around your neck that they put under the shoulder straps and it attaches to your helmet so your head doesn't, you don't break your neck, essentially. And uh, get in, fuss with the lap belts, fuss with the shoulders. Split the balls. Split the balls with the submarine in between the legs belt. The uh, shoulders you can tighten up when you're out on the track. You can just reach down and, and just pull them, yeah, sure. pull like them down. Like a backpack strap. Yeah, the, the lap belt's hard to get to. That's kind of tucked up. So okay. there's always the semi-gay dance of the straightest guy in the world who's like the pit guy or the whatever guy. He's reaching in your crotch and he's vigorously trying to get things plugged in and stuff. And then he's kind of snugging them down. He's pulling on okay. them and it's tightening. And for me, the last thing that goes on for me, and I sometimes don't even put it on until we get out to the to the grid, is my gloves. Gloves are thickish. They have some contact on them, so you can kind of get some grip. They're not farmer's gloves, but they're 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 fireproof. They're big, you know. And uh, so I'm sitting there in the car, and I, I put my left hand on, and I go to put my right one on, and I can't straighten my two oh boy. fingers. Oh yeah. You had you had mentioned the, that might be an issue. Yeah, the last time I did it was about a year ago, and I was just kind of standing outside the car, and I could kind of work it. I wasn't really under the time constraint. So, for people who aren't totally sure what you're what we're talking about, two of your pinky and your ring finger on both hands are not you cannot straighten them anymore. No, and there's also a question of I'm not sure how the gear shift is going to work exactly, but I figured out that my fingers are bent actually the direction I <laughs> oh, want yeah. them to go. Born to race. And yeah. I'll get back onto the steering wheel. But my hands are giving me difficulty. So uh, there's a little, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to cause a fuss. I don't want anyone coming around mm. wondering if I can do this or not. I, I think I can do it. I'll just go around the track. So, And that's how Hook's crawling. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> JJ Arms. <laughs> So I start trying to put my glove on and two fingers are going into the one hole and the Oy. one and I, I I can't get it. I got the I got three in, I can't get the two, they're bending down. They're bending toward my palm yeah. and they're not and so I'm just sitting in the car and I got the you know, the guy with the radio headset on and we're sitting in the we're sitting in the paddock and everyone's fired up the engines and everything. And I'm I'm like sticking my right hand out of the window. Now he's on the left. I wish it was my left hand, but I'm sticking my right. I'm folding it in front of me, just sticking. All he's seeing is like my palm and a glove not really on on it. And he's kind of looking at me, and I'm like, you get, help it. <laughs> help like, it out. What the fuck? The car race is ready to go. My mittens. You, know, you put your fucking mitt on. <laughs> and he's like, straighten your shit out, you know, and it's, it's going in the same hole. And I, I can't hear him. I can't talk. My voice is shot. So I'm, <laughs> this I keep a great like, comedy of errors. I keep shoving my hand at him, and he's standing outside the car now, and he's like, trying to wiggle oh, the yeah. finger oh, in and wiggling and everyone else is leaving for the hot grid and and I'm like you know he's got one and then one's tucked I could feel one's tucked into the same hole again and I'm like pulling it out I keep shot and I can only get it about four inches out the window yeah, sure, because sure. I can't move my arm all the way across and, yeah. and he doesn't really know what's going on because we didn't really discuss this and I didn't really learn it until I sat in the car. And I think if you screamed dupe and drins, that wouldn't have helped. No. So not that I could use my voice. So <laughs> then he was like caught on and he was working as hard as he could, got the glove on, got out to the hot pit. And uh, and now you're just sitting there. You just sit and you wait. And, and at some point, but I'm looking, there's clouds everywhere, but it's not raining. There's a lot of clouds. But the track's dry, okay. and 
you see the guy, the, the woman, she'll hold a big sign up, says five. That's five minutes. So We're going to Five <laughs> minutes. Yeah, she's in a bikini. <laughs> So it's a English weather. <laughs> We're going in five. So she holds the five up. I'm like, okay. Then I start seeing the first drops mm. hitting the windshield. Mm-hmm. Now there's no windshield wipers and it's just beating up on the windshield, but it's just barely, just kind of barely. You don't have windshield wipers. No. She's got the track of blades. Yeah. <laughs> Should have. Now you can see from the picture here, you'll see yeah. some, you'll see some. Some drops just starting to beat yeah. up and and ominous clouds, but un, unsure if the track's wet. Now, remember, we're down at the bottom of the track. I love your name spelling. Yeah, my name is misspelled <laughs> yeah. on the on the readout. Um, at the top of the track, you're up uh, 700 feet up at the corkscrew. Could be raining over there. Right. I don't know. Uh-huh. I just know where, where we are. There's little drops hitting the window. And remember, all you have to do with that car is punch the accelerator once, and the rear tires will just light up. And if it's wet, you're not getting, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. You're not you have, you have no grip whatsoever. And nobody at this point decided to do rain tires. At this point, we're either going now, right, or or not, <clears throat> because by the time we get back in and change the tires and stuff. But I mean, other people's cars. No, nobody. No, everyone's just sitting there, and then there's a little discussion. Like, are we going? Or are we not going? Because the the people, the track officials, are outside the car, and they're feeling little raindrops <laughs> coming down. But is it gonna rain, or is that just a couple of droplets? Yeah. So, do they treat the windshields of some kind of Scotch guard or? You know what I mean? In case some splashes on you or rain. I, they have like a rain X thing you could uh. you could put on there that would wick it away for I mean. pussies. But I'm not sure, and it's also not quite like your family car. So if you're there's different pressure points on the windshield because there's low pressure points or trying to get induction into the engine and stuff like that. So it's not just like wind hitting your windshield, okay. but it's also if you had a windshield wiper, you would flick it, it would clear the windshield, and then you could see if there was more rain. Ah. Uh-huh. But I can't see if, so we get going. I think we just get, uh, we'll just get trotting around the the track a little. So now it's a little wet. I've never driven the car before. Oh. And the windshield has water on it. But I don't know, I don't know what that means. I don't know if it means it's raining or drizzling. <laughs> The hardest part. Oh, there he goes. Up, oh, broke a hundred. But the track is wet, or might be wet, or there's still a bunch of droplets on the on the window that you'll see is when you go around, scared to get into it because the car will just flip around. It'll just swap swap ends on you. So this is just the beginning. It's just the parade. Not parade, but it's just like try to get some get your bearings. heat into the tires and see if it's going to be raining up at the top of the hill or not raining. Or It's not my car. I don't want to fuck it up. So... You can see that I'm seeing water drops move around on my windshield, but I, and lots of black clouds. Dark clouds, yeah. Unclear whether the track is wet, wet or not. So you can, you can see a lot of water moving around. We'll put this up at our YouTube page, adamcurl.com slash YouTube. But all right, so that, that, was the, that, was, uh, that was Thursday session. So we get out, they bring us in get out of the car and I was like I didn't really really get into it because I just was staring at droplets on the windshield the entire time wondering what it meant what was going on with this behemoth that'll just uh, we'll see we'll come around the straight and you'll see in in first gear it'll just it'll just light up the the rear tire so you go around in first gear there we go oh Stay on the track. Damn. All right. There he goes. So um, get out of the car, and uh, there's a telemetry 
this is kind of interesting. They have a whole semi truck dedicated to telemetry, all the information, and I won't even be able to scratch the surface of it, but, and it's something I didn't have the last time I did the race, but it's, it's really cool, which is uh, you get out of the car and they have everything's up on two computer screens and there's a guy running it and they have the, they have the screen, they have the one cameras on you, the driver and the other cameras, the one that's going straight mm -hmm. ahead down the track. It's got your RPMs. It's got your speed. It's got G force. It's got brake pedal pressure. Like you're not braking hard oh. enough. You need to be more aggressive. Advanced metrics. Yeah. They put you next to your teammate and they'll go, see here, turn three. He's doing 71 miles an hour. You're doing 58 miles an hour coming out of this. You got a lot to pick up here or coming down after the corkscrew. He's doing 90. You're doing 77. You know, you can pick it up. You can pick it up here. Now, I don't know if I can pick it up or not pick it up without this information because I don't know if the car is just going to slide off the track. Right. It feels like True. it's going to break. The whole thing is like you're turning, you're turning, you're turning. It's pulling you. It's pulling you. And at some point it breaks. And when it breaks, you're, it just goes. But these guys know when it's going to break. And I don't know when when that car is going to going to break loose. But you go with the telemetry. And it's like, here's how many RPMs, and here's the brake pressure, and here's the speed, here's your tire temps, here's the G-force, here's what you're doing in this part of the track. You, you know, my teammate, Ken, who's a professional driver, is a team owner, they're like, through turn four, you're only eight-tenths of a second off of his time. So I'm like, well, that's good. And then you lose a bunch of time mm -hmm. after turn four. So you need to pick it up on turn four. It's just, it's like side by side yeah. where you yeah. are on the track, where they are on the track. You can overlay your racing line, like show like a top view of wow. your line yeah, you're yeah. driving versus through the ideal. and versus the ideal versus here's what your teammates line wow. is through the same thing. It's, you know, it's a little humbling because it's bad a, for bad students. <laughs> it's a, it's essentially like, yeah, being called, it's, it's like a radio air check yeah. 10 minutes after you sign off. You know, you're just sitting there. Never good. Except for the difference between that and this is that you're learning nothing other than to hate your program director. <laughs> this is like, oh, I could pick it up here and I could break harder there and what gear and short shift and blah, 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 blah. So I, I learned a lot and I turned a very slow lap time of one minute, 38 seconds. One minute, 38 seconds is fast around that track, but not in this car. This car, you, you want to be down in like the 128s. That's what my Ken, my, my running mate was. He was at full 10 seconds. Okay. So there were like, I think you could get four seconds out of this. And of course I was like the rain, the rain, the rain. I didn't know what was going on with the windshield. I thought it was wet out there. I was taking it easy. And they're like, all right. So, uh, but what's it going to do Friday when we get back into the car at, um, noon, 1230. Something. Oh no, no. I think we're getting back in the car at uh, two fifteen start. Now we're going out again Friday. So you check the weather report. Oh, it's going to rain all Thursday night, but then it's supposed to be nice okay. on on Friday. And sure enough, we get there Friday morning. And, uh, well, I'll show you a little bit of the beginning of something we were cutting together. It had poured. It had poured all night. You can get to the long one, Chris. You know, the nah, nah. Um, It had poured and poured buckets all night. And there was big puddles everywhere, but oh. the track was pretty dry. And we weren't going back out for a couple hours. Ooh, and I was it. like, all right, well, the skies look pretty good. You can see that's wet footage of how hard it rained and how big everything was puddling up through the infield and all the cars. That's and very, very wet. It's very, very wet Friday morning. But by Friday at noon, it had dried up and it stopped raining and everything appeared to be fine. Or did it? Or the end. did it. So uh, we went out Friday, and um, it was dry, and I'd looked at the telemetry stuff. Oh, that's cool. And I was like, I think I can start getting back into this. I can start trying to push on this car a little bit and see see what it'll do. I mean, like I said, 138, that's embarrassingly slow. 
Maybe I can get it down to 132, 133, which is still slow enough, but I can, I can take four or five seconds off of this, especially if I'm a little more familiar with the car and I think it, I think it's dry out there. So um, we went out and I'll, I'll show you now what you're seeing here is a lot of water by the side of the track, which I didn't, that's going to come into play in a few minutes, which is the track was dry. You can, you can stop it there, Chris. The track was dry, but turn three had a little stream going oh. across. It. Oh dear. Just, it, it, there was just water. It rained so hard that, Water had built up by the side of the track. Now, the side of the track is normally dirt, and you can do what they call hang a tire. Uh-huh. You can get a tire into that dirt. It'll, it'll throw you off a little bit, and you, you'll, you'll keep going. You'll, you'll be fine most of the time if you do what they call hang a tire. But this ain't hang a tire in the dirt. This is hang a tire in a lake which is not something I'd ever experienced. And it never, it never rained anytime. Right. All the millions of times I've run on that track, it's always been in August and uh, bone dry. But if you go back a, a little, well, I'll show you. All right, I'll just show you the lap before the incident. And uh, you can kind of see what one sporty lap looks like on this, on this track. Now, the now this is how it's supposed sunset. to be? This is how it's supposed to be. To get up to 145 at the end of the straight. Now, the other guy's getting up to 152. I'm still kind of feeling my way around the track. You go real slow around turn two, and then you get into it. Now, you see there's water right there. Yep, there's yep. ponds everywhere. Yeah, off the track, there's ponds. On the water, it's just a, on the tracks, it's a slight stream going by. You turn through turn four. You head into the turn. You get to like 135 going into this left hander up the hill. You can see it's beautiful. Oh, oh yeah. It's picturesque. Looks like a video game. Yeah, it's funny. People have seen so many video games now <laughs> that everything looks like a video yeah. game. It's almost as good as a video game. Almost. There we go. Get to 131 at the top of the corkscrew. I couldn't see over the dash, but you have to aim for the split tree in the middle, and then you get back down. That is analog. Ironically, yeah, they tell you weather tech. Yeah. <laughs> so you go all the way around, and you get back into first gear at the end of the straightaway, and then you go right back all the you mow right through into fifth into fifth gear, kind of. Porsche dive bomb me. Fuck that guy. Yeah. Well, here's where it gets a little hairy when you're coming over the hill at 140 miles an hour and you're next to the person. <laughs> but that guy was real good. These guys are professional racers. They drive these cars uh, all day long. So um, I was starting to get back, starting to get into it. Yeah, good. I uh, turned a, um, a 131. <laughs> all right. Which took. Seven, seven seconds. Took seven seconds off. It's still... They're hoping for four or five. Hmm? Right? They're hoping for four or they're, five. Yeah, we're hoping for four. So nice. uh, I got seven off. And I'm, I'm kind of a quick study. I start real slow, and then I kind of build it, yep. build it up. So I was thinking to myself, you know, I think by the time we go out and qualify this afternoon, I might, I might get it down to like a 129 or something, and then I'll be kind of in the mix, kind yeah. of respectable. Uh, and also... Um, it's a, the track still had that stream going across it in the middle of turn, turn three. So you got to figure that's, that's worth a second. You get rid of the stream and everyone's going to pick up a, a second. So I'm going to get to the one thirty mark minus the stream. But, uh, and I've never seen that where it stopped raining five hours ago, but it's just this steady stream oh. was just floating across the track with a big lake. Feels like fixable. Yeah. Right? It does. Maybe a couple of sandbags. And they, they would have done it probably for the race, but maybe not for qualifying. It's a, a little bit weird. A lot of guys were having trouble there. Over the weekend, a few guys got off the track there. and uh, It was one of those from management. Yeah, everybody's been saying that. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. In, we get that a lot. <laughs> well, I ended up getting off the track there 
as as well. Okay. And it wasn't all right. So what ended up happening is I hit the water, the car shimmied a little, started mm-hmm. to skate a little. Now what I what you don't want to do is yank on the wheel and try to fix it. Because it, it'll overcorrect. You'll itself. just spin out. Just let go. Right. I was just like, let go. I'm Close just gonna, eyes. I'm yeah. just gonna track out here. I'm just gonna go a little wider. Don't. I'm not gonna fight it. I'm just gonna go a little wider. I'll hang a couple tires into the dirt. I do that all the time. But I forgot that the dirt wasn't dirt. The dirt was a lake. So uh, here's the, uh, here's what happened. So we're coming over the top of the hill. Coming down into turn. Foreboding clouds. To foreboding clouds. Got a Porsche in front of me that's fast. Turning right. Go through the water. Skate oh, a little there. Hang the tire. Oh, there it is. Don't hang the tire. Hung it into the oh. lake. Oh. oh big Busted up his butt. Big hit. <sighs> big hit in the back. And the scary oh, part no. is when people buzz by you. And you're yeah. fo- you're fogging up. You can't uh, see what's coming at you. We'll go through the water oh, right no. there. Oh, so the water was right in the middle of the turn. Drove through the water. Got a little bit loose. Hung oh. it into this lake. Don't hang the tire. Hung the tire into what would have just been dirt, but it was a lake. And... I'll tried to go. track it, and it just kicked me back onto the track. The scariest part is not the the, the bump, but when right here Crash. after this, when it's the, the exhaust, I assume starts to uh, fog up your window. You're like, I don't know what's coming. Hope it's something good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, this is We're me slow driving the car. Now I'm disgusted with myself. <laughs> Thank you, Hans D- device. Dis- hey, you got your gloves on. Disgusted. <laughs> oh, embarrassed and disgusted. So so that's that. It jacked up the back of the car. Oh. Uh, it, it's pretty fixable, but not not on the weekend. Someone's going to have to do some welding in order to get that. They didn't have their welding rig. You Goo. can see what the back Ooh. of the car looks like. Yeah. And of course, everybody's got to come by <laughs> and take a look at the remains. Tough break, Ace Man. Yeah, oh, everyone yeah. comes by. What happened? What'd you out do? There? <laughs> What'd you do? <laughs> yeah, oh boy. And then they look at the car and they go, "Oh boy, that's bad." And then, thank um, you. And uh, here we are. But uh, it was fun. Did you have a good time? I did okay. in a, in my own my own weird way. I, I missed the race. I would have loved to make the race. Obviously, I couldn't couldn't get the car back together in that uh, period of time. Did you go to watch the race? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the race was... You just brood and destroy your hotel room? The race was great. No, I got out of the car. I I, I, I was... I don't know what, what I was about it. I, I was sort of philosophical about mm-hmm. it. I was like, all right, well, I'm going to crack a beer. and <laughs> We're going out to dinner tonight. And uh, it was it was good. We went down to a 17 mile drive <laughs> the next day, which is spectacular. Eleven yeah. bucks to get in, by the way. Really? Yeah, oh. they charge you to go drive on a California really? highway. What? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a toll road. Yeah, <laughs> and I love that it's eleven dollars and twenty five cents because oh, that's the we only. thought we thought about this uh, yeah. right. move. Wait, I'm not. I mean, I've done the drive up the coast. This doesn't ring a bell. I don't remember paying for anything. I it's I think it's newish. It's oh. a COVID thing. Oh, okay. come on. Okay, that was beforehand. You gotta you gotta pay. So wow. brutal. We uh, anyway, the, everyone was nice. They understood all the water was on <laughs> turn three. <laughs> they also they dealt with it. I didn't I didn't deal with it, but I hung that tire on that lake, and that's on me. Question: You kind of just answered it, but I don't mean to pile on. I'm just trying to get my. I'm just trying to understand everything. So, in was it just muscle memory? Like this is the place where I hang a tire. When you know that seeing what you saw in front of you, that would not be a good place for that today. Yeah, I just went. It's wet, and I'm kind of sliding. And if I try to pull it, I think I'm going around, mm. which I should have done. <laughs> Would have been a be- m- much Love better outcome. But instead, I want I can just track out and hang the tire, <laughs> and, and then I can go through. Now I'm not even sure what water does. I'm going straight. Like maybe I can just make it through right. this. But I wasn't even really thinking about the lake bite. I was just sort of used to hanging it there for Got the it. dirt. 
which, uh, you know, like I said, it's it's kind of commonplace to hang a tire there. But uh, You did it. You'll do it again. Yes. It jacked me up. I was fine. I just felt bad, felt embarrassed. So whose car is it, and what kind of conversation is that going to be? Um, it was started off in, as, in a cordial way. Um, we, uh, <laughs> you get to go right back to the te- telemetry semi and watch yourself wreck the car. That's yeah. nice. See, here's where it all went wrong. <laughs> they start pulling stuff off the car. You know, the rear clip was destroyed. Um, the the fiberglass and everything. That was all. The bodywork was. You know, it's all fiberglass. That that was dust in the wind. Then they start seeing like is the frame bent, what it do to the suspension, did blah blah blah, and it just kind of looks like the very rear clip where the where the fuel tank, or I should say, the fuel cell goes, was bent, and uh, they they'll clip it off and just weld on a new whatever. Shouldn't be that much parts labor. Shouldn't shouldn't be too much. But I, I told them I would be responsible oh. for it. But uh, force majeure, yeah. act of God. I sure, mean, that, that, weather. That corner was wet, man. How many other races that happened to? Um, nobody in... She had a text now, me hold on a second. Yep. Many people throughout the day, but not in my run group. Uh-huh. There were probably... Uh, they had Trans Am 2. They had TA1, which was my run group. There were probably... Oh, in TA1 and whatever other group that ran with us, there's probably about, I don't know, 13, 17 cars that are out there. It happened in, to some of the vintage guys. It happened to a guy in an Audi like supercar. It happened to a, a few people over the course of the week, but also timing because not everyone was running during that time. Some may sure. have run later or the next day or whatever it is. But my group obviously knew that track understood the dynamics and the wet and the in the rain and they they figured it out i did not how does it work do they invite you back potentially do you is it I, are you I shunned i don't know that we even know how you got into this thing aside from you know being the car guy yeah yeah matt deandre is out there always trying to kick some tires pardon the pun and uh, you know see if anyone wants to do it and the guys were all like they're very nice. They're all guys on the tracks. Like you, you can you can drive this car. You can drive these cars. You just have to you have to come down and get a test day in, so you can figure out a lot of the stuff, like the telemetry mm-hmm. stuff. Like if you get in and get a test day, then you you'll figure out a right. lot of the yeah. stuff, and then you can go out there instead of having the race day be a test test day. Well, that's stupid. That you're missing so much information if you don't do the telemetry. Yeah, the, the telemetry is awesome, but you'd want to theoretically do it midweek before mm. the race weekend all right so we still had a good time sonny got on his bike all went right. circles for a, a thousand <laughs> times oh so romantic we went down to a 17 mile drive look how happy you look yeah we had no, a he's good, just squinting we had a good we had a good weekend went Got out it. to dinner with willie t ribs how was that three hours worth of him telling stories that <laughs> can't be repeated on the air <laughs> and a good time um and also willie showed up at the track after the crash and he's like what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. The car's busted up for the. I'm gonna find you another car. <laughs> I go, what do you find? Some of these guys brought extra cars. Let me go get you a car. I got Willie. I I don't know. I don't want to crash someone else's car. I'll get you a car. You're a racer. <laughs> Kept yelling wow. at me. <laughs> racer. We'll go get another car. No. I was like, Willie, really, don't don't get another. Willie's car. got a can do attitude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we had fun. It's, it was beautiful. The vintage guys were all there. It was all. It was all in all a good weekend, good. and you know, at least I crashed a car where they had w- these weird weather conditions on one goddamn corner. All right, let me tell you about BlindsGalore.com. They got a huge sale starting this week. Everything is up to fifty percent off. It's a great time to buy new blinds or shades with Blinds Galore. Blinds Galore dot com believes you deserve high quality custom blinds and shades, shutters and drapes. Everything Blinds Galore creates is 100% custom. Nothing gets made until you order it. Order it. Designer product without the designer price. Don't bother with the store. Do everything right from home. Their uh, exper- their uh, expert team is happy to help every step of the way online or over the phone. Blinds Galore will even set you up with free samples and free shipping. And uh, 
top free expertise as well. They know what they're doing. Family owned and run for over 20 years. It is Blinds Galore, right Dawson? Whether you need more privacy to sleep in or just fix up a room, Blinds Galore is just what you're looking for. Order 15 free samples today to get started on BlindsGalore.com and let them know that Adam sent you. That's BlindsGalore.com All right, we'll take a break. We'll come back with the news right after this. Give the news with crap. News with Gino Grad. Break Viral, weird crime, protest, politics. Give me news with Gina Grass. Stuff they saw on TMZ. Joe Biden, Kamala. Big news with Gina Gina Grad. The news with Gina Grad. I'm getting some breaking news literally right now since we started recording, uh, you know, a half hour ago. Um, it's official. Twitter's board has accepted billionaire Elon Musk's offer to buy Twitter and take it private, according to the company. The announcement ends a weeks-long saga Musk kicked off when he offered to buy the company for about fifty-four twenty a share that he said was his best and final offer. This is uh, all from CNBC. I'm just reading it off the screen here. Twitter's board sought to fend off this hostile takeover by adopting a so-called poison pill, but they said, oh, screw it. Take it. And that's going to be a $44 billion deal. Now, Musk has hundreds of billions of dollars, but he's not liquid. So Mm -hmm. he probably had to move a couple things around. Yeah, he raised the money. Yeah. And he got other people. Right. I think he raised it. I don't know if it was all his money. He didn't write a check. Right. And uh, now we'll uh, see what kind of changes come in the very near future. Yeah, well, we have a bizarre relationship with Elon Musk in this society. We, mm. we love him, and mm-hmm. the space thing is great, and the electric cars are all great. Then he gets a little erratic. Mm. Then he wants to buy Twitter. Um, Did I, he accuse the one guy of being a child molester who wanted to rescue the kids? Yeah, yes. in uh, Thailand, maybe? Uh, but there was a lawsuit, and I don't know if anything became of that. That's all I remember. Yeah. I think the guy, the, the kids were... Trapped in a cave in yeah. Thailand. All One the documentary is awesome. Was trying to get a semi submersible right. to go get him. Elon wanted to like send one of his submarines over or something. The guy told him to pound sand his and ego then was he call, called him a pedophile. Yeah. And I don't, and then there was a lawsuit, but yeah. I don't know what that lawsuit was. I mean, it, that's probably, that's probably exactly how it ended. Let's just make this go away. I'll make it worth your while to just not bring it up anymore. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what he's basing his pedophile on. He was pissed that they didn't want his little floaty. Yeah. Device. Well, that usually gets uh, garners a douchebag or something. <laughs> yeah, pedophile yeah. runs a little deeper. Now he was saving kids, maybe just to molest them. Oh, oh the spoils of his labor. Right, more for me. I didn't yeah. realize that. Okay. I don't. If I don't you guys know. saw the documentary, it was awesome. Mm-hmm. The rescue on uh, Nat Geo, which is part of Disney Plus. If you have mm-hmm. Disney Plus, you can watch it. It's really great. <laughs> and it would have seemed mm-hmm. like a submersible, submersible would not have worked because they are tight turns right. that the guys like squeezed through. Right. So mm-hmm. maybe it was that's maybe that's where the no th- thanks but no thanks came from. Yeah, Elon won the defamation defamation case. So he is a child molester. Oh, the rich get richer. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I mean, Chris, Chris can look into it. I okay. suspect he just wants to bring back uh, a little more of the freedom that we all were promised with Twitter, and I think that's what it's going to do. I, I don't. I, I it's it. Look, it's not going to be an issue. We'll, sure do, we'll, we'll move on. All anybody yeah. wants is an edit button. So yeah. I think that's uh, as long as they get the precious edit button, everything will be fine. Mm-hmm. So this happened a few days ago, as everyone knows, but there is no way in hell we are not talking about it. The other punch heard around the world happened over the weekend oh, when Tyson. Mike Tyson beat the shit out of this annoying dude behind him. Yeah, we have, Sonny was just, delighted by it's this. It's so great. Um, apparently, the guy who got his ass kicked has a rap sheet. So he's he's no stranger to trouble. Uh, Melvin Townsend the third has mm. been convicted of fraud and grand theft, burglary, possession of controlled substances, and trafficking in uh, trafficking in stolen property. He's thirty six. Um, he's but he was incarcerated for twenty months in two thousand nine. This is street justice in the air. That's right. right. Mm-hmm. Again in twenty nineteen for fifteen months. Uh, Tyson was filmed just. Beating this guy on a JetBlue fight fr- flight from San Francisco to Miami last Thursday, the man and his companion who shot the video that we'll watch were reportedly harassing Tyson and his annoying him. Shot the video? Oh yeah, oh the, the friends commenting That's through the whole great. thing. Yeah, um, police have not pressed charges, though Townsend's lawyer argues that Tyson should have just contacted a flight attendant. 
Yes. Um, here's a clip. This is uh, from TMZ, but it's like it, it was on TikTok or whatever, and it's like a bunch of clips edited together. So here's mm -hmm. like, it's like a minute long. Mike Tyson, bro. This shit crazy, bro. Mike Tyson. He's standing above him. Showing his friend annoying him. Man, he over here rapping with Tyson. Tyson's, Mike Tyson trying to Tyson's some a shrooms. super friendly guy until he's not. <laughs> right, sure. You don't know how to act. He's like an alligator. Tyson you know, looking pretty out, docile, pretty doesn't move much, yeah. and then, you then he moves. You his money. Peasants. Calling him a peasant because he's flying commercial, I guess. And then here it comes. Hey, 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 Tyson, Tyson over the seat. Hey, Mike, Throw, Mike, come on. Throwing right. Let's let's and then check this guy out. Net flight. <laughs> Howdy got face. Up by Mike Tyson. Turn that way. Yeah, Seeing some open up. wounds. Got some, got some ring marks on his forehead. <laughs> this guy's just a clown. Like, he's still... Like, he must be wasted. Did he uh, up, was that uploaded to TikTok, yeah, I assume? Or? Yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm not, you know... <laughs> I got room, you know, for the family with the two-year-olds who won't keep the mask on and they get thrown off the flight and then they get on some no-fly list or right. something. I, I got a lot of sympathy for those yeah. people. I don't have any sympathy for this. This guy can take the fucking bus mm -hmm. for the rest of oh, his life. He just fine. He has gone outside of the social contract. He's proven himself a person who's not worthy of flight. Are you saying he <laughs> fucked around and found out? That's, That's exactly right. right. That's, That's right. what happened. Yeah. Um, let's talk about something that... I think you'll be very happy about because you know how um, you, we've talked about, you know, the, the wife gets what, a thousand dollars for a wedding dress and then every, what, 10 pounds she gains, what happens? Um, let's see. I got to look it up in one okay. of my books. It's You get a thousand dollars. That's your base for a wedding oh, dress. And then every like you have hundred to, you go over, you have to stay that weight. You have to fit into fit, it yeah. for a year after the wedding. So but, if you want to go another right. thousand, we got a decade of you trying to squeeze <laughs> your fat ass into that, into that dress. Got it. And what's the equal, uh, what's the equal and opposite one for um, men in the police academy? Oh, that's, you get one bulletproof, bulletproof vest. vest okay. when you leave the academy at 167 pounds. And if you balloon up to uh, 275, there's going to be a lot of you to shoot <laughs> hanging outside that vest. Well, somebody took you up on that. Hmm. A new controversial policy is forcing officers to slim down or face consequences. This is out of Texas. KHOU, I imagine it's out of Houston, news in Texas reports that cops will need to lose weight by the end of the year or face disciplinary action. Uh, according to Dr. Documents obtained by the Dallas Morning News, men with waist sizes over 40 inches and women with sizes over 35 inches will now have to track and share their weight loss efforts. Officers who don't trim down by December uh, can be denied promotions, overtime, even removed completely. If the documents, um, let's see, oh, it's designed <clears throat> to keep good health, physical fitness for officers. But those who don't slim down despite passing all their physical fitness tests could be disciplined still. The police, uh, the the policy applies to 4,000 total officers, and this includes state troopers. This includes the Operation Lone Star guys that are doing the border mission. Well, look, it's part of the gig. I mean, it, it, you know, it's it's sort of like being a Hooters waitress. You know what I mean? Those, Indeed. You knew the job was uh, dangerous when you took it. I mean, that's, that's what it is. You want to... You know, maybe if you're air traffic controller, we don't care so much. But if you're chasing, if you're a rocket or a cop, how are you going to slide across the hood and yell "No time for backup" when you, you can't get up over the fender? Right, you dent that hood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're already winded. Yeah, and, and look, as much as everyone hates this shit, whether it's a kid or a cop, it is for you. Right. It is yeah. your health that we're we're talking about. You're out there. You're exposed to COVID and God yeah. knows what else. Lose the weight, or even just like a a foot. Uh, foot like a chase? yeah, foot chase. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, they they listen to you. Bill Murray, beloved, everybody loves him. He pops up in people's wedding pictures and random stuff, mm -hmm. and everyone's a fan. But like, apparently, there's a little bit of an open Hollywood secret that like he's kind of a pain in the ass on some sets, and that's happening again. Mm -hmm. Production on the film Being Mortal has been halted after Bill Murray, who stars in the movie, who Aziz Ansari is directing, by the way, was accused of inappropriate behavior. Um, 
According to the New York Post, he was touchy with women. He's very handsy. Um, and they well, said, this is yeah. inappropriate behavior as of 2022. Right. When he was on the set of Ghostbusters in 1986, Hold it was that not. Hold that thought, because I have other examples. Because that's what I thought. I was like, oh, poor Bill Murray. But now it's like, oh, wait, other people are chiming in. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, it, someone even said, like, it's not illegal, but it's crossing a line. And you go, yeah, 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 who cares? Well, the film, which is is uh, Aziz's directorial debut, suspended indefinitely in order to investigate the allegations. And then a lot of other articles started popping up. And here's just a couple examples. So Ben Dreyfus, Richard Dreyfus's son, did this long tweet thread about um, Murray's alleged behavior on the set when they were in a movie together. He says, Bill Murray had a meltdown during What About Bob because he wanted an extra day off. And Laura, she's the producer. Yeah, well, that's, I'm telling you, it goes back. Laura... Ziskin, who is the producer who had her own uh, Twitter thread about fights with Bill Murray, um, said no. And then he ripped her glasses off her face. And my dad complained about his behavior. And then Bill Murray threw an ashtray at him. And then in another tweet, he said everyone walked off the production and flew back to L.A. And it only resumed after Disney hired bodyguards to physically separate my dad and Bill Murray in between takes. And then Lucy Liu chimed in. Remember, everyone said, like, oh, she was a pain in the ass to work with. Yeah. And well, he, she, he only lasted one Charlie's Angels movie. Right. And she chimed in back in, you know, 2000 when they were in you know, Charlie's Angels together. Uh, now, or I guess in the last year, she's opened up about how he would hurl insults at her while filming. And Drew Barrymore corroborated. And Lucy Liu was like, I don't even need your corroboration. Like, this is what happened. So, I mean, Mercurial on set? Mm. Yeah, I think I look, some people are some people just interact differently, like the guy in the flight with Mike Tyson. Sure. Not how we would have handled no, Mike Tyson, no. but that's how he handles it. Yeah. In they're, general. They're guys, it, it's it's funny. I don't know, I always kind of picture Leno when I see him out there with the public. You know, he goes and he talks, you know, he walk behind someone at the track who was holding the pizza box and he like, came up and went, yeah, I have a piece of pizza. And the uh-huh. person was like, what, huh? Oh, hey, it's Jay Leno. You know, <laughs> some people get a little kick of, like how they celebrities, I should say, like how they make other people feel or doing things. Some will go in and surprise someone and do something. So he's that guy. He's a little nutty too. Yeah. I think, uh, I, I don't know how much of it is a dominion. Like I'm going to sort of, I'm the big fish uh, in this pond and I'm going to walk up to you and I'm going to kind of do what I want to do. And there's not really anything you're going to do about it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to dominate you by yeah. being weird in a way that you can't really tell me to stop. But it's but it is weird because like he isn't he sort of famous for like not having a way to reach him. Like he doesn't really have like a phone or like mm-hmm. a phone number. Like mm-hmm. he's it, he's just he's kind of all over the map in terms of like eccentricity. Mm-hmm. And he loves popping up in random people's like bar mitzvah pictures. Ugh. But he like throws ashtrays at Richard Dreyfus. I think he's weird. Yeah. An eccentric, and then that can go a million different directions. Yeah. That means he could hang out and play the bongos mm-hmm. in your apartment with you and your roommate in right. Austin for four hours, and it could be the best day of your life, yeah. or you could be ducking an <laughs> ashtray that he's throwing at you. I think it's just called being weird. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys see the Bill Murray stories? <laughs> yes. No. Documentary. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I think you actually... I think I heard about it from you. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, it's just a collection of people telling, like, yeah, here we were, my kids' little league game, and Bill Murray just went the dog out and started to coach. <laughs> like, we like stuff like that. Eccentric. Yeah, yeah. I, okay, I buy that. You just never really know what. Eccentric turn it's is take. stuff that. Eccentric is stuff that's cool if Bill Murray's doing it, but if a, just a total stranger does it, it's off-putting, dangerous, yes. and weird, yes. right? Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, we have a big follow-up. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago, I told you that Red Bull was going to have those two dudes who were cousins fly a plane, jump out in the middle of it, switch planes, and then like take them up, like, and, and everything's going to be okay? Yeah, I I realized if I tried that with one of my family members, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at some point in the air, we'd notice that we're both heading toward the same plane. And I'd go, you said, no, no, (laughs) read the text. You said we're going to switch plane. No, I told you I was going into the session. We'd have a big argument and then we'd hit the ground. That's right. If I tried this with a family member, that's how it would work. What are you doing in the plane? Stop yelling at me. Through your voice. I don't like your tone. (laughs) 
Well, it depends if you're, uh, you know, a glass is half empty, glass is half full kind of guy. It Mm -hmm. half worked. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, So both pilots, cousins Luke Akins and Andy Farrington, engaged their plane's air brake system, then jumped out at 12,000 feet in the air. Uh, While Akins was able to get into the other plane, Farrington was not able to because the plane started spiraling out of control. And I'm going to show you. Mm -hmm. Uh, He deployed his parachute, safely landed. Um, The uh, the plane also had a parachute system. The real people that were in danger with the stunt was the large preschool on the ground, just under. They could have picked any location. Any location. And that's what they picked. More than conceived. Yeah. So luckily, no one was injured. Um, According to the FAA, the stunt was not authorized, and they are not happy. Mm -hmm. The agency is investigating. There's really no... I don't know if there's any uh, FAA official that's going to rubber stamp this. So let me hear what you're going. <laughs> so you want to go to the back of your plane? No, no. No. I'm jumping out of my plane. All right. So you're parachuting. No, no. Not, I'm not I'm supposed jumping to. out of my plane. Well, then who's landing your plane? Oh, don't worry. My cousin's going to be I got by. a guy. My cousin, Bo. Oh, is he a well, licensed please. aviator in the jump seat? He's a kind of a catch-as-catch-can kind of. He likes Mountain Dew. <laughs> And okay. he's going to be well, jumping out of his plane. But the two planes are only going to be unpiloted for <laughs> 40 seconds or so. And then we should be able to get, you know, God willing, right. one of us. Although he's not a pilot. But I'm almost it, certain this violates some regulation. Let's go ahead and stamp this here. Yeah, I, I'd like to see I, this. I don't think they would rubber stamp Well, that. this is about, I don't know, maybe a minute or so. I just wanted to get them sort of jumping out of their planes and then see what happens. Mm-hmm. So here we go. They jump out. They jump out. And it's a little hard now look, to see. I can, I can add a lot to this because I did that eye fly thing under sure, the fan with right. the guy hanging onto my waist yeah, three consultant. feet off the ground. Yeah. So I can tell you right now, this is terminal velocity. Oh, wow. So they're flying down. The one guy... Not doing so good. Get into the plane down low, and the other one is spinning out of control. So that one's that one's not going to work. So he's fall. just going to have to bail on that and pull the chute, right? Yes. He got, but he got the other one. Yeah. Well, somebody did it. Not bad. Not bad. He's pulling up the little latch. He's <clears throat> commanding control here. He's in the seat. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Now, they go after Red... Are they going to go after, like, Red Bull or something and go, hey, man. Well, if you're talking about empty bags or not, you'd have to go after Red Bull. He sponsored this. Yeah. So, he, he one guy made it. Yeah. Okay. That's not nothing. No. It's it's half the of... The other guy lived? It's half of nothing. Yeah, or it's right. uh, more than half of that's nothing. That's right. All right. But that everyone lived. No. Yeah. And they did it out in the middle of God Bumfuck or yeah. whatever. Yeah. All right. All right, let's do one more because Mammoth's here. Okay. Um, well, let's talk. I, I'm sorry to end on such a sad note, but we do have uh, someone we do hope that they rest in peace. Cynthia Plaster Caster Albritton mm. has died after a long illness. She was 74. The name suggests that she was the one who kind of invented that uh, sort of infamous plaster casting in the 60s and 70s. She's from Chicago, and her whole career launched in 68 when she met Frank Zappa. He wouldn't let her do it to him, but he did sort of help her move to L.A. and always kind of stayed friendly with her. She'd hang out with rock stars and get them to put their dick in plaster. Their erect dick in plaster. Mm -hmm. And the first, any guess on the big uh, first? uh, Jimi Hendrix. That's right. I was about to say Hendrix. That's exactly right. So the process incorporated a dental mold, you know, when you're getting like um, like a a retainer or something and they put that in your mouth. Yeah, uh, it solidifies around your tumescent penis and then it just kind of comes out when you're no longer too It's a mm-hmm. so pretty easy process. And uh, she had an ex- exhibition in they New York. They put that straw in there so you can breathe? <laughs> I breathe through my cock. Oh, well, yeah, you'd need to ask for mm-hmm. something. It's a silly straw. That's right. <laughs> you know who else was pretty big about that same time? <laughs> Tiny Tim. And Like tiptoe through he's, the tulips? Yeah, he's not really a small guy, so I don't girthy. know where you got the name Tiny, oh. but there, maybe there was something there. Well, Cynthia would know. Now, I know this song, but for you lay people who aren't as familiar with Kiss's catalog, perhaps you remember this ode to Cynthia Albritton herself. A stirring tribute. <laughs> Still better than Lick It Up. That's right. 
And then we could do my water displacement test with the mold. Yep. Oh, sure. We get the graduated cylinder right. and see what dude rocks the hardest. Yeah, in just this dip town. it in. I'm uh, told from Chris that we need ball pullers for Indianapolis. So yeah, I don't so know just, if you have that info. Uh, email us questions at adamcarolla.com. In the subject line, just put ball puller for Indianapolis and we'll, uh, we'll contact you. All right, uh, let's bring it home, Gina Grad. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. Uh, last but not least, in the first half, there's JB Weld, world's strongest bond. The brand DIYers and pros have trusted for over 50 years. You can use their epoxies, their super glues, putty sticks, and wraps for. Projects big and small on practically any surface. And I'm talking about metal, wood, plastics, glass, ceramics, whatever you need to bond together. You keep it in your kitchen drawer, your toolbox, craft supplies, maybe in the garage. I have them at the shop. I have them in the garage. I have them in the tool drawer. I have them everywhere. Also, the proud owner of Herculiner, the original DIY truck bed liner. If you're looking for the world's strongest truck bed liner, Herculiner, well, they got you covered, man. JB Weld, it's available everywhere at jbweld.com, Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, AutoZone, Advance Auto Parts, O'Reilly, Amazon, Michaels, and more. And it's proudly made in the U.S. of A. It is JB Weld. Well, playwright, author, filmmaker, an all around interesting guy, David Mamet, joins me next. It's time for Nicaraguan Name That Movie with Adam's buddy, Oswaldo. See if you can guess which movie this famous line is from. Open the pub by door hall. If you said 2001, A Space Odyssey. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. You're correct. Now, back to the show. David Mamet, playwright, author, filmmakers, made... Every movie you've ever loved, and I, I could just go down the list. I saw I was there on Broadway ooh, 18 years ago. No, when you did Race, I think oh, yeah. was the name of the yeah. play. I was in the audience, uh, David Allen Greer. I'm trying to think who else was in that. Lots of lots of big James, names. James Spader and Kerry Washington. That's right. Young Kerry Washington. Yeah. Oh, my God. She was great. She was so young that she was happy to see me when I went backstage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's how young she was. And Richard Thomas, who's a four, four. Uh, what's the name of the book? My new book's called Recessional. Recessional. All right, I just wanted to get that right. The Death of Free Speech and the Cost of a Free Lunch. What does that mean? It's available now on Amazon, by the way, or wherever you get finer books. Yeah, well, it means this. Uh, you know, I I, I was uh, in the, the terrible years of COVID. I was sitting every day and uh, didn't make any sense to me to write any more plays because the plays weren't going on and... Uh, I like to write. And so I was in the midst of, between a couple of novels, I started writing essays about what I saw going on around me mm -hmm. uh, in the world. And I'm very influenced by a couple of American writers who just wrote marvelous short essays about life. The, the first one is a guy called Eric Hoffer, who I recommend to everybody. He was, uh, he grew up in the, like the 20s and he was d uh, blind and deaf until he was 10, then he got over it and he went on the road and never knew his parents and he was autistic, I think. He washed up in San Francisco and worked for 40 years as a stevedore. And he'd go home every day. What's a stevedore? Ste I beg your pardon. A stevedore is somebody who works alongside a ship and is in charge of loading and unloading the, the cargo. Mm -hmm. So that's what he did. And then he went home to his one room in Chinatown and wrote these magnificent books. They're basically, they're, a lot of them are just paragraphs, but what's going on in the world? And so I said, wow, that, that guy's really... Uh, He's got his eye out. For example, he he said in 1950 that the the Great War of World War III was not going to be with the the communists, but with the Arabs. Mm -hmm. And he's a guy who just sat on the dock every day and looked at the world going on around him, mm -hmm. and then went home and tried to figure it out. So that's what I try to do in these essays: is say, wait a second, I see free speech is going away. I see that the the uh, legacy media have just turned completely toxic that uh, public education has followed uh, private education down into the sewer. 
and uh, that people aren't talking to each other and that people are terrified to talk to each other because it could get them canceled, as indeed it can. So I started writing about the death of free speech. Yeah, I, I always ask sort of to what end or what's the end game or what are they looking for? You know, there's sometimes there's different reasons things are done. Sometimes it's a nefarious plan. Other times it's just trying to get some ratings in the next 10 minutes. What, you know, you just take something like COVID, everyone who pushed back against the orthodoxy was hammered into submission what is their plan? I could never really figure that out. I don't know if anyone knows. I don't know what your head is on it. Well, that's an excellent question. That's what I was trying to figure out. Then one day it occurred to me as I was writing all these essays that you look around and you say, well, there's this swine over there and there's this idiot over there and there's this whore over there. And I'm talking about people uh, who are in power because it's always easier to be in the, in the opposition than to be in power. So being a conservative, I'm in the opposition. So it's easy to say, well, but wait a second. Could it really be that uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and Joe Biden and blah, blah, blah had sufficient power to bring about this complete turnaround into an America that hates itself, which doesn't want free speech, which doesn't want to educate its children, doesn't want to defend its interests abroad? So I said, no, that's not possible. Well, then what are we looking at? I said, what we're looking at is a cataclysm in Western civilization what happens, it happened in World War I, it happened in World War II, it happened to a lesser extent in the Vietnam War, um, it happened in, 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 during the Crusades, it happens once in a while, where there's a huge cataclysm, and what happens in a cataclysm is that opportunistic infections come forward, mm -hmm. right? right? It's not that the pimples are causing uh, your gastric upset, right? right. They're, they're, they're the thing you see first, but they aren't causing it. Yeah, it's, I don't know who said from the Obama administration, you know, never waste a disaster or yeah. catastrophe or whatever. So it, it seemed to me like COVID came down the pike and, you know, it's funny. It's like whenever a natural disaster hits, they always say, you know, no gouging. You can't charge more for propane or plywood, but in a way living in California, what Governor Newsom did was gouge the populace. He's like, oh, there's a natural disaster and I'm going to jump in and I'm going to take advantage of this. Oh, there's no question about it. So what happens if any anybody's here? Our country has uh, subsisted to this time because we have a constitution and the constitution exists not to it's not a loving document about feelings. It's a, a document about human nature. And it's saying, we got to find some way to go along because you want what I got, I want what you got. But there's a, there's a place in the middle where we say we're all going to get along and it's going to be fine, but we must obey the rules. Right. So every once in a while, some, some side gets too much power. They say, screw the rules. I know what's right. There's no such thing as justice. I'm going to call it social justice, right? There's no such thing as racism anymore. I'm going to call it incipient racism anymore. And if you don't like it, well, guess what? I'm going to cancel you, and maybe maybe you'll go to prison, and maybe some thugs will kill you. But there's a place in the middle where we can meet, and we can't meet there without free speech. When everybody on the left, everybody on the left, and especially the far leftists, are um, demonizing the right and demonizing people who say, wait a second, that's the point that what we've got. Wait a second, can we talk about it? When that person's a demon to the legacy media and to the schools, where, where are we going to meet in the middle of the road? Well, you know, they have a plan because of how they start labeling everyone. So, you know, all of a sudden you're an anti-vaxxer if you don't want your 11-year-old son yeah vaccinated or if you don't want to wear a useless paper mask on an airplane you're anti-science you know and and all this and when or at some point we're all everyone who disagrees with them is somehow racist I, I don't know that crept in recently but at a certain point it's all ad hominem and it's like well wait a minute are we discussing the subject or whether masks are effective anymore or are you just calling me a racist yeah so it's an attack on free speech because if people can't speak to each other we can't 
we can't meet in the middle of the road. And it's basically, we got a centrist country, a little bit on the right, a little bit on the left. Every two years, every four years, we kick, kick the, those son of a bitches out and put new son of a bitches in. And we stumble along as this wonderful country. But now, all of a sudden, there's no civic pride anymore. I mean, look at San Francisco, New York, uh, Boston, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles and, and uh, Seattle. Where's the civic pride? Rather than, rather than saying what keeps us together, we have pride when we go to the uh, uh, ball game. But other than that, we're a terrible, terrible group of people. Right? It's people wallowing in guilt. But the, the country, what's going to, what is happening is when a country says that, someone's going to come over and take them over. They're going to, they're, if, if people like Obama and then. Uh, uh, his assigns come in and say, this is a terrible, terrible land. I'd like to apologize for everything we've done. I'd like to stop drink, uh, drilling for oil. I'd like to abandon our friends uh, over in Iran. I'd like to turn our backs in Israel. We will no longer defend our borders. Someone's going to take them up on it. And that, that's what Putin's doing. Well, Putin must be laughing his ass off because he got involved. I mean, there's always, Russia always gets involved. China gets involved. There are many players that get involved with like elections, but his main angle was to get us to argue about race, not the steel dossier. It was more, we're going to argue about race. And we found that out. We still played right into his hands. And Obama's kind of interesting because he started off pretty neutral about race. Like he said, look, if I don't win, it's not because I'm black. It's just because I didn't do a good enough job of putting forth my message. Somewhere along the line, he sort of started turning into a race hustler. And I don't think, I talk to Dr. Drew about this all the time because I've been yelling about it for 20 years. I don't think these people really know what them talking about us living in a systemic racist society or cops being killers or cops, you know, hunting young black men. I don't think they really know the damage you're doing or where this thing is heading or just how dangerous. Well, this I, I is. don't think they care. I mean, look at Nancy Pelosi tearing up the State of the Union address in right. the back of, of, of President Trump. The, right. the, 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 you know, there's a uh, William Butler Yeats was the greatest uh, poet since uh, Shakespeare. He wrote in the, in the 1920s and so forth. He said, uh, uh, can, I tell, can I tell him a poem? Sure. Uh, now the truth is out. Be secret and take defeat from any brazen throat. For how can you compete with a man who, were it proved he lies, were neither sh shamed in his nor in his neighbor's eyes? Bred to a harder thing than triumph, turn away, and like a laughing string upon which mad fingers play amidst a place of stone, be secret and exult because of all things known, that is most difficult." So here's a guy, and he's, he put his finger on it. What if, year was that? That was probably 1920. It was called Song of a Man Whose Work Has Come to Nothing. So he's saying if someone doesn't un, is never going to undergo shame, either in his eyes or in his neighbor's eyes, that, that person turns into a beast. I mean, look, look at the things that we accept. Uh, uh, President, uh, what's his name, Clinton saying, depends on the meaning of what is, is. Or Alan Ulmer saying about September 11th, some people did some things. As Alan, um, God, what was her name? Um, it wasn't Alan Ulmer. It was, no, uh, I beg your pardon. It was one of the other. One, one of the, the squad. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, I'll think of her. It wasn't Presley. It was um, uh, Alan. We had the Alan part, right. Or, Omar. Omar. Alan Omar, was it? Ilhan Omar. Ilhan. Ilhan Omar. Sorry. All right. Uh, yeah, that's the part that I always kind of get stuck on when I'm thinking about this. Like, they get up there, and they start talking about what a racist country this is and how the number one problem we face is white supremacy in this country and stuff like that. And I always go, don't they feel weird? Or doesn't their wife say something to them? Or doesn't one of the other guys who's been around the block a few times go, eh, you, no, they shouldn't they're, say, they're, talk that way. They're, they're living in the bubble. I mean, that's the terrible thing about the, the suburbanization of America is people live in completely unitary groups. They live in the bubble. Mm -hmm. you know, conservatives don't live in the bubble because wherever we live, we have to put up with leftism. And a little or a lot, but we have to put up with it. So we're exposed to both arguments. And and but leftists don't. And uh, so nobody ever says to them, "Well, wait a second, 
because wait a second means, oh, you're out. Right. So how, for your personal journey, you grew up in a way like I grew up. My grandmother was a little bit of a communist, a very progressive parents and family. And, and I just sort of looked at it and went, I don't feel like this is working for you people mm -hmm. or for any of the countries that have implemented it. Uh -huh. So I always kind of talk about it in terms of, I always have this analogy, which is uh, whenever I go to Leno's shop, it's got a car, Chrysler from the 60s. It's a turbine engine car. It's like a jet car, you know? Yeah. And everyone loved the idea of the jet age, you know? We're getting mm -hmm. away from Henry Ford and the Model T, and we're getting into this turbine jet engine. It didn't work. It just wasn't efficient. Just same internal combustion engine that's in the Uber that dropped you off is the same one that was in, you know, Henry Ford's Model T. And I feel that way about communism and socialism where they go, this is new. This is a new, we're going to do a new take. And I'm like the old tried and true flathead V8. That's what works. We know it works. And they just don't like it. It's like hard work. It's like diet and exercise, study, you know, respect your elders. Like it's all there. It'll get married. Don't have kids until you get married, you know, save money, you know, be responsible, blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's all there. And they're like, we don't like it. That that's, that's of the past. We want our turbine car, except for it doesn't work. Well, yeah, but, but uh, that's part of the thing that people don't study history. They go back and they read Marx and you see what, what communism has been doing for, for a hundred years. It's, it's slavery. It's not like slavery. It is slavery. And that's why in the communist countries, they would always kill people who wanted to leave. Now, everybody wants to come here. Why, why would dark people, people of color, want to come to a racist country? Well, well uh, oh, I see that, 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 the, that question itself is racist. So I say to friends, they say, well, it's a racist country. I say, point to it. Oh, so the only answer they have is, oh, come on, you can't be serious. Oh, come on's the number one answer. Yeah. When they go, there's systemic racism. Yeah. And you go, what is it? Show it to me. What's the system? By the way, point it out. Let's see if we can fix it. And they go, oh, come on. Yeah. And then they go, you tell me there's no such thing as racism? Yeah, I go, exactly. no, that's not what I said. I said, we don't live in a racist country. There's shark attacks. Doesn't mean we live in a country where people are being eaten by sharks. You can go in the water. Well, indeed. But, you know, the other thing that I found out was that the whole George Floyd incident with uh, uh, Chauvin, right? He was convicted of, like, what, second-degree manslaughter or something. They got murder. Murder, yes. But nobody at the trial suggested there was any racist motives. Nobody. It didn't come up. No. So, I mean, think about that. Th that yet that was the impetus for Black Lives Matter to take all this power? It was not called, and they didn't try to do the special circumstances, hate crime, any of that. Yeah, amazing. The, 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 the media covered it like a lynching, but in the actual courtroom, it was not brought up, which is interesting. And yes, that's the impetus of Black Lives Matter, a non-racially based crime. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Well, well, well first off, they can convert any cloud into racism that could convert smooth peanut butters, racist versus chunky peanut butter. They, they, they sure. will start. I mean, the, the second somebody like Elon Musk wants to buy Twitter, he's then labeled a racist. I was, uh, I mean, COVID became racist. Yeah. Uh, Rhodes, Buddha Jed says Rhodes can be racist. Like they are, they've realized that, the racism card can be thrown out and that works successfully to shut up about 96% of Americans. Well, one of the, the great, our great contemporary writers, very honored to be his friend is Shelby Steele, who wrote a book about 20 years ago called White Guilt. And he said, black power and white guilt are exactly the same thing. And he said, what, what in the world are you white people on about? And, uh, he's Shelby, a black man. He's, people, yeah, Shelby's a black man and uh, devoted his life uh, to the black community and has, has uh, in many ways suffered for it. Well, let's talk about suffering for it because I, I know, and I've heard you interviewed, you've been successful, you've made a lot of money, you have what I like to call F me money, which is better than F you money, it means you can do things that hurt your bottom line, even mm. you, just because you have convictions and you have dignity. And so for you being conservative and having to 
navigate Hollywood and then Broadway and New York. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it's, it seems a, a almost ridiculous or impossible balancing act to be conservative and to write plays on, on Broadway, navigate Hollywood. But how does, how well, did that I, work? I wrote plays on Broadway for many, I have a play on Broadway now. It's got, um, uh, Lawrence Fishburne and Darren Chris and Sam Rockwell on them. It's an old play of mine, American Buffalo, that they seem to that that, that uh, New York seems to have taken to, and that the New York Times has allowed it uh, uh, to run. <laughs> but I wrote plays for many many years on Broadway. But the audience for which I wrote those plays uh, is gone. They aren't there anymore. It's just like saying I owned a field just south of uh, uh, Los Angeles, and I ro- raised these great avocados. It's the best. A soil for avocados in the world, but oops, they they built Disneyland there, right. so I ain't I ain't buying I ain't uh, planting no more avocados. So the middle class audience and the upper middle class audience that in in uh, inhabited New York for the fifty years I was writing plays there is not there anymore. So what what who goes to the theater is tourists. So the tourists become uh, probably became a tourist attraction. So when people go on a, on, a, on a tour, they don't want to see a thought-provoking uh, exploration of blah, blah. They want some excitement. I understand that, right? Mm-hmm. People aren't going to go, as I said in a book, people aren't going to go to the teacup ride to be enlightened about the nature of life. Right. But Hollywood, in, in coming out as a, as a conservative, sorry, we moved your mic, in uh, Hollywood, now it used to be, Coming out as gay in Hollywood was tough. Uh, now, and then maybe at a certain point, it became a tie between being conservative or being gay. Now you're going to get a few woke points if you're gay. You'll actually probably find more work in Hollywood. But conservative's tough. When you come out that way, um, it's difficult. And the people that do all, the people that never stop bellyaching about blacklisting and McCarthyism and all that are more than happy to apply that to someone they disagree with politically. So yeah, sure. how's it been for you? Oh, it's been great. But, <laughs> you know, I, I, um, the first time I came out, I think it was 1978, 1979, I wrote a movie for Jack Nicholson and Jessica Lange. And I wrote a bunch Postman of- Postman Always Rings Twice. Postman Always Rings Twice, yeah. And I wrote, Ooh, good pull. Oh, yeah, thanks. And uh, but the, but that business has changed too. I'm you know I'm so I'm just creeping up on seventy five. I'm so blessed to have uh, had all these decades in the theater and all these decades in movies. But back in the days when you found some guy who was a producer or some woman who was a producer and they had, they knew somebody who had some money, they say you want to make a film? Yeah, sure. You made the film accountable to no one except the box office. So what happened is the the independents went away and basically the studios went away and with the introduction of the internet and streaming, it's all corporate now and for example, Netflix, just their stock just went glub, glub. And they said, you know what? We've been concentrating too much on quantity. Maybe we should concentrate on quality, right? So I spent 40 years in the movie business and TV where I didn't talk to anybody. I said, here's the deal. You know, here's how much money I need to make the thing. I hope you like it. See you at the opening. And if you don't want that deal, I'll, I'll go someplace else. So I, that's not going to last forever. Well, your uh, book is about the death of free speech. Um, and I want to get to the part where it's the cost of a free lunch as well. But so breaking news, Elon Musk has got hold of Twitter. Did he buy it? Yes. Oh, thank God. Yeah, it, it is true. And, and and here's the part that I find interesting. With, um, people are feel like they're saying the quiet part out loud now. Like, we can't have Elon Musk doing that. He's going to open it up and uh, we need to regulate speech. And they're, they're saying it, news out loud. Yes, I, they're of saying course, this. Like, of course. These, these are journalists. Not anymore. I guess not, but they're journalists who are agitating against free speech. That's right. Um, and I can't believe they're saying it into a microphone, but they're saying it into a microphone, and they don't bat an eye. Yeah. They, they don't feel that that's ironic. They're worried about him. Uh, I think it's important. Why? What, first off, I'm old enough to remember when the left was all about free speech and letting your freak flag fly and open forums and this, that, and the other. The right was a religious community and they were writing letters to the radio station because of some language Mm -hmm. you use. And the thing that I kind of found interesting is the right, the religious right, 
conservatives back in the day when I started in the radio 25 years ago, you'd get letters saying he said bitch or he said God damn it or he said something. It was about it was about the verbiage. It was about the words. That's true. Now the left doesn't care about any of the language you use, but they go after your ideas. Yeah, they they attack ideas, and that's a much more insidious place to be because the language you can clean up, you know, everybody's listening to terrestrial radio go, this GD guy cuts me off on the freeway and he's, he's got his, his, his bees next to him and she's a bee, you know, we can do it. But ideas, especially when you think about all that's gone on in the COVID era, someone having an idea yeah, about it and they're going after ideas and that feels much more Orwellian to me. Well, it is Orwellian. It, uh, they're a bunch of whores, is what they are. They aren't journalists. They aren't newspaper people. They're a bunch of whores, and they're in the, they're in the pay or in the pocket of uh, the legacy media. And what they're doing is incredibly shameful. And so, what I wanted to do in the book was call them out. Say, wait a second. Let's give it a name. It's it's not the road to totalitarianism. It is totalitarianism. And if we who've benefited from free speech and benefited from the sacrifices of generations of Americans who died for free speech are not going to speak up about it, then, then what we're doing is shameful. What do you think happened to the average American? I mean, just look at the COVID chapter, even BLM, for instance. You know, I was sitting here year two years ago and the young guys run around here. It's like, oh, Friday, we got to put a black box next to our Twitter. It's BLM day. You know, uh -huh. and I said, I'm not doing that. And they said, you got it. Otherwise we're going to get into trouble. Someone's going to call us out. Someone's going to retweet it, you know, whatever. And I said, I don't agree with black lives matter. And I'm not putting a box yeah, good for you. next to next to my Twitter. So yeah. no. And, uh, all throughout COVID was a lot of, you can't say this and you can't do that. I turn out to be right about everything, but okay, you can't do this. Who are the people? Because the people are really enforcing it. I mean, you can blame legacy media as much as you want, and I blame legacy media too. But they have to get a little army who has to do their bidding. You know, yeah. there's only so many of them. They, they really have to captivate their, their audience. Yeah. And then their audience will go out and do all the policing. There's not enough cops to police masks on beaches or outdoor trails or whatever. But once you get the populace... And then they'll do it. What? And for, first off, I'm wildly disappointed that Americans were this malleable and this soft and this weak is and and this un-American, really, for lack of a better term, as quickly as they got there. But how do you sort of wrap your mind around so many people just went all in on that? Part of it has to the, the, has to do with two things. So it has to do with uh, the crisis of prosperity. Our country has just became so prosperous and there wasn't anything left, very little left to get incensed about. And we stopped educating our children. We, we sent them to these public schools that warped them and we sent them to quote higher education that radicalized them. And uh, then this was coupled with the greatest change uh, I think, certainly in my lifetime, which was the computer age, where everyone was constantly connected. So the children, the the cyber natives, grow up to two generations of them saying, how many people like me? How many people dislike me? It, is this liked? Is that not liked? Always being connected, 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 which meant that they never turned a goddamn machine off and looked around them. And in the middle class, what was left of the middle class, the kids went to college and never got a job. So they never got punched in the mouth. They never had to shut up and show up on time. They didn't serve in the military. They didn't get married. They, they thought uh, everything should be free. And they raised their children, and now we're seeing the result of that. Yeah, I know you've worked a lot of jobs. You know, yeah. before your successful playwright, I always, as a blue collar person who was a carpenter and worked a lot of those jobs too, <laughs> it was funny. So I was driving home from doing a race in uh, Laguna Seca up in uh, Northern California. We're driving home and we're driving through uh, like sort of farm country. They're picking beans or, or strawberries or whatever. It was a Sunday. 
And uh, these poor guys are just out in the field, just bent over, just picking strawberries. Yeah. And I think my son was in the back, and you know, he said, like, oh, man, that's a tough way to make a living. And I said, hey, um, I used to clean carpets. I used to dig ditches on construction sites. I'd done demo, busted out stucco, you know, dragged it to the dumpster. I mean, it was a whole day of that. I said, it wasn't any different than what those guys are doing. I mean, I was breathing a lot of dust. They're bent over. But those are the kind of jobs I had for, for many years. And I learned a lot from you. You get a real sense of gravity when you really are in this sort of mechanical world. And I worry... <clears throat> that the mechanical world, it was something that we all lived in. I mean, you, you couldn't avoid, you know, 200 years ago, you had to go start a fire, you know, yeah. chop some wood, you know, what hook up the team, get the, get the saddle hooked up onto the horse and, you know, whatever the tactile mechanical world is. We're drifting into this digital world and the digital world doesn't really have doesn't have guardrails or gravity or boundaries or borders. It's just kind of this John Lennon kind of, I imagine this yeah. place. And I think it's fucking up a lot of people. I really think they need to go into the garage and build a canoe. Well, there's no question about that. Um, but there's a lot of the country, probably 51 or 52% that has conservative values, which means to me American values, right? Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, free speech, the right to keep and bear arms, the right of assembly, the right of religion. Those things are in great peril. And the kids who are raised with nothing to refer to except these stupid effing machines are uh, in great danger. And I don't know if, I don't know if you can come back I think it's like being raised in, in a sick uh, household that you don't know what you were taught so that you don't know that you're living out a sick fantasy. But uh, the, there's a lot of the country that still believes, as we saw in the last two elections, in uh, the American way and believes in all of those freedoms and believes in freedom of religion and freedom of speech and gives them something greater to believe in than this silly little box the size of a package of cards that tells you how many people might like uh, what you like. What do you think they're worried about? You know, when they're worried about Elon Musk. They're yeah. worried about exclusion. The anything, like I say, it's it's like living in a, a sick household where daddy is, 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 is having sex with seven-year-old little Susie, right? The problem in that household is not that daddy is, is a pedophile and a rapist, but that nobody can mention the problem. That's the problem. Because if anyone mentions that problem, the family falls apart. You save little Susie, but the family falls apart. So everybody in that family is devoted to keeping the secret. So what we see from the left is everybody's devoted to keeping the secret. That's why what they fear most in the left, look, uh, it was Napoleon said, look at what your enemy tries to frighten you with. That's what he fears. Mm -hmm. So what the enemy is trying to frighten us with, the left is trying to frighten us with is exclusion. They think that's the worst thing in the world. Oops, if you say X, Y, Z, you're out. If you say because they're terrified of exclusion because their only power comes from the group. That's I mean, very well said. Thank you very much. Who on the left would you want to have next to you in a barroom fight? Let's see. Is it Rachel Maddow? <laughs> exactly. Maybe. I don't know. Lesbian bar? Um, but I, I figured she might know the owner. Uh, the, the, yes, it's, it's very well said. And I hadn't really thought about that, which is the group is the most powerful unit to them. And so what they lord over you is you start talking this way about this subject and you shall be booted out of the group. And what they don't really realize is that to many people, the group isn't the most powerful unit. The family's a more powerful unit or community well, well, yes, or church indeed. or whatever it is. Exactly so. But if you take those away, all this left is the state, which is what Marxism always tries to do. They say the kids have to turn in their parents. Religion doesn't exist. We aren't going to have any more clubs anymore. There's nothing except the state. And that's what fascism is. Fascism means the group. Nothing exists but the state. Yeah, I never understand, though, why, to me, <clears throat> I'm not a big fan of government, 
Uh, I don't think they're good at stuff. Um, I, I don't think they'd be much good at making a car or making a taco. I like competition. I like the, you know, free markets and all that stuff. So there's one group that's the left that is constantly trying to grow government. Yeah. And then there's this other group on the right who ostensibly wants to be left alone. Exactly. Most, most, you know, I just got back from the racetrack. All that is, is a bunch of right leaning people because they got to make it work. They have to change the gearbox. They got to mm-hmm. get the ratios down. It's tens, thousands of seconds. It's, it's all, it's all mechanical. They can't, there's no pie in the sky. No one talks about how they felt yeah, it went, you know, I felt like I did a very good qualifying lap. We got to stop watch. There's a beacon on your car. You did a 132.75. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what it is. You can't tell me what you felt like. And I know how they feel. They're very mechanical people. And what they want is ostensibly the government to leave them alone. They want to go out and do what they want to do. They want to go race their cars. They understand that the fuel has to be shipped in a way that's safe. And then believe me, on the racetrack, there are rules. You know, you can't go out there without a helmet or a Hans device or whatever it is. And you have to learn what the different flags mean and when there's a full course caution and double yellow and blah, blah, blah. But essentially, they just want to be left alone. And that was the deal that this sort of country used to put out, which is come here, don't break the law, don't pollute the river, and we'll essentially leave you alone and you can do what you want. But somehow there's this new group that does not want anyone left alone. And I and it's overregulated. And I don't get what's attractive about it. Well, you know, you you, you boil the frog little by little, you don't throw them into boiling water. Right. Right. And so people who grew up with this whole idea of uh the, look, the American century was extraordinary. You know, the, the 20th century was American hegemony in this country, which had never existed on land or sea prior to 1776, became the most prosperous and eventually the freest country in the world. And the prosperity, as in all things, eventually leads to decay. Isn't it, I mean, look at a tree. Right. You know, it, it, it's not going to live forever. At some point, however healthy that tree is, it's organic. It means it lives and it's going to die. If you want that tree to live a little while longer, you have to prune it. So that's what we have to do with our government, like Calvin Coolidge did. He said, cut out 90%. And they said, what would you do then after we cut off 90%? He said, cut out another 90%. (laughs) Who gave us the 1920s, an incredible time of prosperity. So the... uh, uh, I was. I, I had two experiences last week. I got t- time to tell a story? Sure. Okay, I got two experiences last week. One was I went to the Motor Vehicles Bureau, and the other one was I went to a flea market. Right. Mm. So I go to the Motor Vehicles Bureau, and I always say that anybody who gets a letter from the government that they weren't expecting, what's the first reaction? Yeah, oh, shit. Yeah, it's fear. Right. So we know that's about government. Right. That we're frightened of government. We go to the motor vehicles department. Everyone is stand in line, shut up, wait your turn. You better be all full of yes, ma'am, or yes, sir. They don't want to hear your jokes. They don't want to hear your excuses. They don't want to hear, oops, I thought this, oops, I thought that. If you want to get out of here in a day with your driver's license, you know the rules. Shut up. Everybody there is miserable. The people who work there are miserable. It's a terrible job. Someone does it, God bless them. But the one thing that they have to do is they aren't going to take any nonsense from anybody, right, because they're leading a a rather dull life. Mm -hmm. Everybody's unhappy. You go to a flea market. The only rules are behave yourself, don't hit anybody in the head, and we'll work it out. You say it costs X, I say I want it cost. Everybody at the flea market is happy. Right. So that's what we're talking about. On the left is the motor vehicles department. Do we need government? Yes, as little as possible. On the right is the flea market, right? Do we, do we want free enterprise? Yes, as few rules as possible. So... That's what we're looking at in America now, and most of us lie in the center, but it's not going to fix itself. And what the left keeps screaming is, give me more money, give me more money, give me more money, because that's what politicians do. They're a bunch of whores, left and right. There's some few exceptions, but basically they're they're second-rate people who like power because it gives them money, and they like money because it gives them power. That's why we have to vote them out all the time. 
What do you? Uh, what's your take on Elon and Twitter and this? I think this it's great. Why did nobody say what Jeff Bezos doing trying to buy the New York Post, the Washington Post? I know, I know. Well, the same people are like, you want some billionaire running social media? It's like, yeah, that's what well, about well, Jeff yeah. Bezos? Who, who do you think? Who do you think's running social media? Listen, I love I love Elon because he needed a payload for one of his rocket ships, so he put one of his cars in for a payload. Right, that's cool. No, I, I agree. He's he's a free thinker, and he has the ultimate, uh, again, F me money, which is more than F you money, and they can't control him. And I, they, I really feel like they're driven insane by the people sure. they can't control. It's like, look, you've got Tucker Carlson over here saying this X, Y, and Z over there. And then you got the aforementioned Rachel Maddow over here, Chuck Todd over there, or whoever, Nancy Pelosi over there. Fine. He's got his opinions. They've got their opinions. Why is his opinion so dangerous to you? And why do you need him shut down? And why do you need to control it? Because it's I, dangerous to him. I, Be- dangerous to them. Yeah. Right. I, it, it, Ch- Tucker Carlson doesn't care what Joy Reid says. He yeah. makes fun of it, but he doesn't care. She can say whatever she wants. Why do you care so much? And yeah, it it it, it like it, me. I think you're uh, protesting too much. I think Shakespeare said, or me. <laughs> yeah, Duff he, thinks you're you protest too much. Like, why are you protesting so much? There, they have a alternative view to what your view is, and then they do it, and they get very good ratings. Why is that a concern of yours? Because they can't stand they can't stand questioning. They can't defend their positions, period. Right. There's no, I don't know of any leftist position that's ruined our cities, that's ruined our young, that's ruined the education, that's ruined the media, that's ruined our country, that can be defended. So the only defense is, oh, I get it, you're a blank, blank, blank. Right, racist, homophobic, exactly. whatever, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. And and then they would like you deplatformed. And again, just do a little better job of making your point whatever your point is the, I think the problem is if you're running on, you know, defund the police, then good luck articulating that, you know what I mean? Good luck winning a debate with that argument. Good, good luck explaining that to your constituency. So well, it's, you can't, all you can do is you if, you, if you disagree with me, you're out. There were 492 murders uh, of black kids in Chicago last year by black kids. Three of them, had to do with police. Right. I don't, I don't even know if those were called justifiable homicides. Or not. Yet, the people in Chicago are saying, well, defund the, defund the police when the, when the citizens in the inner city neighborhoods desperately want the police there to keep order. Yeah. It's, well, I, I mean, when you start scratching around the statistical numbers of who's killing who, Who's getting shot? Who? What's the color of the person killing the person? What's the color of the person that's deceased? Yeah. How much do the cops account for? It's it's an insane it's an insane number. It's not even close. You know what I mean? There's not even a kind of he said she said version for should we defund the police or get you know take more cops off the street? It's insane. It's a lie. It's they're incredibly effective. I yes. mean, if, if 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 you stop, so if you if you stop your average American, and you go, what are the chances of you dying from COVID if you're unvaccinated and forty years old? They'll go, I don't know, thirty percent, thirty five percent, you know, whatever. Point oh two. Right, right. And um, are masks effective? Well, yeah. I mean, in confined spaces, you know, and then you know how many unarmed uh, black men are killed by uh, police officers uh, yearly in the United States. 5,000, you know, I don't know, 14, 17, <laughs> whatever it is. I mean, think about the message. I mean, think, think about, you know, give the devil their due for a second here. Think about how insanely effective they are. Oh, it's magnificent. It, it, it's magnificent. Yeah. You've convinced a country whose law enforcement kills 15 unarmed black youth uh, every year, you've cons- convinced the citizens of that country that it's, it may be 10 or 15,000. Well, look at this. you know, Or that it's an epidemic. 
Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a Jew. I was born right after World War II when they were throwing my people into ovens 15 months before my birth. And that Hitler and those guys taking advantage of the unrest in Germany between the wars convinced the people that all of the problems were caused by the Jews. The, the, the poor Jews were spreading communism and the rich Jews were spreading capitalism. So it would be a good idea, it would be a wonderful idea to take all the Jews and kill them. And what, and they did it by uh, terrifying the population. They said, wait a second, oh, you know, you're a Jew, off you go. You're married to a Jew, off you go. You stood up for a Jew, off you go. Everybody goes into the Hitler Youth. You missed one um, meeting, fine. If you miss another meeting, we're going to kill you. They terrified the hell out of everybody so the, to the point where people were turning on their closest neighbors who happened to be Jews. And Yeah, and Frank was probably turned in by a Jew. Yeah. Oh, she wasn't even that Jewish, as you know. Was a, I'm kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> You're going to get canceled again. Yeah, that's okay. But I did notice that, you know, they're saying, oh, on Broadway, you can't play a, a, a deaf person unless you're deaf. You can't play a gay person unless you're deaf. Gay. So I think they're going to do a production of Anne Frank that you can't play Anne Frank unless you're a dead Jew. <laughs> again, that's called uh, F me money. I guess. Oh, you got to look at your cartoon. Oh, I got to look at my cartoon. Sorry, you you made this cartoon for me. That's what I've been. Yes, I did. But I've been doing cartoons for many, many years. I'm getting such a kick out of it. Mm-hmm. This is uh, Kaepernick's brand uh, knee pads, as used in the uh, NFL. This is very fine. So it's uh, it's knee pads and uh, Kaepernick kneeling, obviously with the American flag on it. Should I hold it up? Yeah, thank you. To the uh, to the camera, can you read that? Okay, Chris, can everyone? Yeah, we got uh, it. We can got everyone it. look yeah. at that? Wow, this is uh, all I can think of. Is this going to be worth something one day? <laughs> I'm putting it right back. Maybe. Yeah. You know, I got we got to get an NFT of this shit, man. I don't even know how that works. Thank you very much. You're welcome. What, so you're doing a lot of cartoons? Yeah, yeah. One of my closest friends, of my, me and my wife, was Shel Silverstein, and he, oh, really? And we, yeah, we. Hung out. When you're in love, the whole world's Jewish? Is that him or is that another guy? Oh, it might have been. Oh, he, or he was he Hello Mudda, Hello Fada? Who was no, he? That, was, Al, that was Alan Sherman. That was Sherman. Uh, Show what where the sidewalk ends and the giving tree. He was the most successful oh, everything show. in yeah. the world. Mm -hmm. So he got me to started doing cartoons. I love doing cartoons because I can't draw. So it's it's challenging. <laughs> yeah, well, does the playwriting come much more easily? To you, I mean, how how does one unlock this gift? I mean, how do you, how does one become this prolific? Like, how is that? Is it something that always resided in you, and yeah, you just I, sort of work blue collar jobs, and it start coming out? Well, I think so. You know, like you, I did every job in the world, and I found that I could actually write. That I had uh, actually had a talent, and I didn't pay for it. You know. Uh, but I had this talent that I could do it. So I said, well, I, this is going to be a little bit easier than tearing asbestos out of the factory w roof. Right. So I said, so Dave, you know, if you screw this up, you deserve everything that's going to happen to you. So I started working on it and I got good at it and uh, made a couple bucks. And I liked doing it, except when I hated doing it. <laughs> when did you hate doing it? Sometimes it's just hard. Sometimes you just can't figure it out. It just won't come out even and it drives you crazy. And that's, if I may, why I started writing the book. I just couldn't figure out what was happening, how the country could crumble while I blinked my eyes. So I said, I got to figure out, you know, I'm sure it's like driving a car. If something's wrong, you have to do a diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? Is it the timing? Is it the spark plugs? Is it the fuel? Is it the blah, blah, blah? So you do a diagnosis so you can figure out what the problem is. I get it. I throw it everything. It must be this. So playwriting is a lot like that. You say, I got a play here. It doesn't quite come out even. I could make it come out even by saying, then they all realize that people are just people. But that's not correct. I got to find out what's hidden in this play that I need to pay off such that it all makes sense. So it's a, it's a diagnostic process and, it, and it's, it's, it's great when you finish it, but it's, uh, it's, it's difficult. You find yourself over the last couple of years, and I found myself more and more doing this with society, humanity, also sometimes even personally with people I knew a little bit better, right? I found myself not so much 
angry, but like confused. Like, what is going on? Uh-huh. What are these people doing? Why are they saying this? Do they think? I talk to Dr. Drew every day about this. I go, do they think this is what's going on? Or do yeah. they believe what's going on? I mean, I get the the labeling stuff. You know, this is Putin's price hike. You know, I don't think Biden <laughs> believes it. But I mean, if we can get the LA Times and New York Times to say it enough, yeah. maybe it'll, it'll come to be. You know, I get, I get that part. But just adults, like I want to write a book called I Never Thought Adults Would Be This Stupid. Uh I have no idea that people in power would be the way they are. And is it, do they believe it? Is it all just to stay in power? Is it the bubble, the circle you, you sort of speak of like, okay, when they say you open up Florida and we're going to have to get a, uh, we're going to have to get a barge and bring over body bags over there. If you want to open up Florida, you open those schools up, you have a, you have a Super Bowl party or whatever it is. And then nothing happens. Yeah. Do they think, huh, maybe I got that one wrong? And and if not, why not? They're educated adults. No, they no, they they've been educated into, into stupidity. And the, 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 the what I realized is what's at stake here is the definition of what's true, right? Mm-hmm. Because you can say, well, it's tr-, they might say there has to be complete uh, equity of whatever the hell that means. Of uh, every show has to have X percent of black people, and X percent of white people, and X blah 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 blah, and gay people, and da da da. But you don't say that about the fire truck, all right? You don't say, wait a second, I'm not letting you. In. There aren't enough trans people on that fire truck, and you have more men than women. I am not letting you uh, save my house. So you see that what's what, what they're talking about on the left is a different idea of belief. It, it's it's just just like it's just like the witch hunt, right? You could say, "Oh, I don't think Susie is a witch," but you couldn't say there's no such thing as witchcraft, right? Right? You had to quote believe in witchcraft, but everybody knew there weren't witches. So what happened is a new way of belief. So they might say, "Wait a second, are you a scientific, logical person going to tell me that Jesus actually rose from the dead? You know people can't raise from the dead, right? But on the other hand, you also know that this little wisp of paper over your face, if we, everybody wears them, nobody's going to get sick, although you see them getting sick anyway, right? You aren't going to tell me that Moses actually part of the Red Sea, you fool, but you are going to tell me that there's a, a, a systemic racism when there's no position in the United States on which a person of color would not be preferred. So what they're doing is they're taking the notion of belief that used to be reserved for matters of faith, right, and applying it to to matters of politics. Do you, one thing that I kind of observed is the more racism goes away, the, the more you know, it's racism is sort of a thing where each year, each generation, it just goes away to, to some degree. You know what I mean? Well, there was, you know, racism in the fifties and then there was less in the sixties and mm-hmm. then less in the seventies. It's just, it's, it's, it just kind of goes away a little bit every year. And, you know, once we had our second term black president it was kind of like, all right, I think we, I think we can turn the page on this. It'll uh, it'll never fully go away, but it's in terms of societal problems, top five, top ten, just not there. I felt very it was very palpable that as it was going away, the people who profited from racism kicked it up a gear. They went, "We're going to have to work harder." I mean, there's now more race hoaxes than there are actual hate crimes in the, in the news. Yes, and who are the victims? Who are the, the, the most hate crimes in the United States are against who? Do you know? Jews. Exactly so. Nobody says boo about that. Well, the, the, the problem with Jews, and that's the problem with the legacy media, which is they have a very difficult position. They're saying we got to keep beating this drum about systemic racism. And when we say systemic racism, we don't mean Jews and we don't mean Eastern Indian and we don't mean Asian. We mean black. 
We just, we do black. That's what we do. So we live in a racist country, systemic race and white supremacy is number one, but it's all, it's all about the blacks. Okay. Who is being punched in the face when they're walking through the streets of Manhattan? Jews. Yeah. Who's punching them in the face? Blacks. Okay. Now we have a problem in our legacy media messaging. That's right. Because Jews are much less, they're more of a minority numbers wise than blacks, but yet they're doing better. So we can't even get our definition of minority worked out anymore because, you know, Asians are doing better than whites, but yet they are much greater minority than the blacks and the Hispanics. Like they're all over the road. They can't figure this. They can't get their story straight. Yeah. So the answer, as you said, is leave me the fuck alone. That's, that's what America's founded on. Leave me the fuck alone. Right, liberty, free speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. We're going to e pluribus fuck them. That's right, and we're <laughs> going to vote you out every two years. Leave me alone. We don't need the government to tell me how to do every last gosh darn thing in the world. Uh, that's what America's founded on. That's what made the country great. I I agree, but it, it's also I, I keep circling back to this, but like. How many people will go right in with this, you know, oh, yeah, it's a racist country and, and all, all this stuff. And I know what the politicians are doing. They want more power. They want more regulation. They want more rules. Yeah. They want more money. They want more everything. It's just scary to me that so many Americans will just trot down that road with them. But, again, maybe they don't believe it. Maybe they're well, just in fear. You know, if you read the Bible, read the, the, the Hebrew Bible, it's the story of humankind. They always want to go back to slavery. Everything in the five books of Moses is people don't they don't like being Jewish. They don't like listening to God. They don't want, they want to go back to Egypt. That the, that the people who try to take them out of Egypt, in this case Moses, are loathed, right? And the people like at, at Jesus, right, wants to take them out of the slavery of sin. They kill him, right? That the the Bible says that human nature is essentially evil, but that it's redeemable through faith and through good works, right? Through tre treating the other person the way we'd like to be treated ourselves. And that's what the Constitution comes down to. It's not saying, let me, let me uh, give this uh, power to a group of people who anybody who ever had lunch, lunch with a politician said, oh my God, this guy or this woman is, a, is an abject whore. They're lying to me and they really don't seem very, very smart. Right? But somehow, when you get a whole bunch of them and stick them in a building in Washington, I'll, I'll let them rule my life. Well, that's human nature. We'd like someone to be in charge. But what, what the, the Bible says is, how about God? Why don't you put God in charge and try to obey those, um, those precepts and see how that works out? Yeah, something that used to be talked about a lot, which is uh, the golden rule. Yeah. Never hear it brought up anymore. I feel like when I was a kid, it was always, you know the golden rule, you know the golden rule. Yeah. It was spoken out loud all the time on schoolyards and by teachers and parents and everything. Yeah. The golden rule is pretty straightforward and would uh, prevent yeah. a lot of the stuff we're talking about. And yeah. yet it's not really preached anymore. Well, part of the problem was we gave our kids up to the, 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 the teachers union. I mean, imagine it. How many people in our, in our lives met a great teacher? Most of us may, maybe met one or two. How many people met a bad teacher? Everybody. Right. Right? Everybody. Does it bring out the worst in people? Maybe. I don't know. But we dream about it our whole lives. We go through our lives having the school dream. Oh, my God, I didn't do my homework. Oh, my right. God, I should have studied. Oh, my God, I don't even know the name of the test. We have that dream because that's our first uh, – uh, run in with the world mm -hmm. that our parents give us mm -hmm. to this world. So if our parents give us to the world, which is unutterably corrupt, we're going to go with that world and turn against our parents. Well, what do you think of this theory, which is, I told you I was just at the racetrack and the racetrack attracts a certain group of people who all think the same way. Mm -hmm. And they're all mechanics and engineers and drivers. And it's like, Show me an airline pilot. I'll tell you how they think on everything because sure. they're precise people and they have rules. They literally live in a world with gravity or it'll kill you. Um, think about the school. Think about the type of person that's attracted to saying, I'll make 
$61,000 a year for the rest of my life. I'm going to get long summer breaks. I'll get long winter breaks. I'll get tenure or I'll get in a union. And, you know, I'm not going to I'm going to stake my claim or hang my shingle or anything or go try my my skills out in the open market. I'll I'll just take a safe place that is essentially a little bastion of socialism or as about as much as we can generate in this country. Here's a job. You're going to have it forever. You're not going to get rich. You don't have to do that much. And you get lots of vacation days. Yeah. All right. Well, then how long before that person's temperament or mindset starts to bleed into their young wards? You know, if, if I took my son and I just said, I'm going to race you at, you're going to be raised at the racetrack. You're going to the racetrack and you're just going to be around a bunch what of a dudes. What a great idea. It would be F. It'd be excellent, but the point is, is he would turn out a far bit different than he did raised in a public school. Sure. So, aren't we just? Isn't this baked in to the bread? Like, of course, it's going to attract these people. That's who you're going to get. And then, and what if they were all vegan? How long before your kid came home and said meat is murder? Of course. Well, that's why the left has always been opposed to charter schools. Right. So the charter schools would would clean up the inner cities tomorrow. If people, if the parents got the right to choose the teachers and say, hey, you know, I don't like what you're doing or I don't like the way you're doing it, you're fired. Right. You got to hold their feet to the fire because if you don't, uh, and the, they had a kid called Pavel Morisov in the 20s under Stalin in uh, Soviet Russia, and he informed on his parents. He said that they didn't have good Marxist thought. They went to Siberia, and the kid became a national hero. They had statues of them all over Pavel Morisov. It's like Greta Thornburg. It's the right. same thing. Yeah, uh, it, it it's sad. I you know, I I agree with you. School choice, competition, charter schools, vouchers, the whole the whole nine yards. It, I find it sad that that be, became. I I know the left is in with the teachers' unions and so on and so forth, but they're sacrificing the kids. Yeah, that's right. And that's a very simple question to me, which is one group is against school choice. The other group is for school choice. What else do we need to know? Nothing. It's a good note to go out on. Yeah. David Mamet, uh, let's see if I can say this right, recessional. Am I saying that right? Well, yeah, recessional. Yeah, okay. I've just never seen it written down. Recessional, the death of free speech and the cost of a free lunch. Well, what is the cost of a free lunch? Sorry, I wanted to get to that. The cost of a free lunch is say people said a long time ago that you, that any democracy will die when the people figure out they can vote to have the government give them money. Yes. So anybody, you know, you work for a living, you still do. I work for a living, I still do. At any point, you can say, I want the government to give me money. I want the government to pay for this, for that, for for uh, unemployment insurance forever, for welfare forever, for aid to dependent children forever and ever and ever. That's uh, it's eviscerating. Yeah, I don't know. Chris can look it up, but I was somebody, I don't know, if it was a founding father or something, but when people can vote themselves money, it's the end of the experiment. Yeah, exactly. And that's so. where we're that's where we're heading. Yeah, because capitalism, as you said, it makes people respect each other. So you're not going to say to the boss, if if my my paycheck depends on, it, I'm not going to say to the boss, you know what, son of a bitch, I don't like your politics. Right. You're going to, you're going to make a cost benefit analysis, right? If you can say, wait a second, if I work harder, that guy's probably going to pay me more. The country's going to be in better shape than somebody who works at the post office, whereas Milton Friedman said, nobody in the post office ever said to his colleagues, slow down, you're killing yourself. <laughs> when the people discover they can vote themselves money, that will herald the end of the republic Usually uh, attributed to Ben Franklin. Yes. Oh, dude. There it is. Uh, David Mamet, thank you so much for uh, joining me. You're welcome. Thank you, Adam. Today, you can go to amcrow.com for all the live shows coming up uh, Helium, Indianapolis, four shows, May 6th through 7th. Just go to amcrow.com. Until next time, this is Adam Carolla for David Mamet saying mahalo. 
exhaust, I assume, starts to uh, fog up your window. You're like, I don't know what's coming. Hope it's something good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is me slow. driving the car. Now I'm disgusted with myself. Thank you, Hans D- Device. Dis- hey, you got your gloves on. Disgusted. 